How many of you, um, how many of you want to change the world? Raise your hand, please. Interesting. How many of you would like to make a lot of money, get rich, and change the world with your money, power, and influence? Raise your hand. Interesting. How many of you want to work directly within the nonprofit sector and probably not get rich and change the world? A fewer people. Okay. All right. That makes sense. You know, these, these, I, I articulate these two paths. They're not necessarily today mutually exclusive um, because things are changing out there. And things are changing a lot because of young people like you. You're changing the work environment out there. Now, sometimes when you have a company um, like I have or like Ken Ross has, Ken is uh, a uh, former board chair of Big Brothers Big Sisters, former uh, CEO of Pinnacle Assurance, and is uh, here today uh, with us. And I tell you, when, um, um, when you're out there running a company, sometimes the change that's coming at us is coming at us from our younger employees like you. And it's tough for us to consider changing. But one of the things I like is that you all are doing some things differently and not necessarily fitting within what may traditionally be a path that's been articulated by us older folk. And it really is strange to refer to myself as maybe an older folk because I used to be sitting right where you are. Well, not in this building. I never took a business course in my life. And I never set foot in here, purposely never set foot in here. I was over in Ross Hall mostly, and my fraternity brothers, I was a Sigma Chi, and a bunch of fraternity brothers used to hang out over here, and I purposely didn't. And so it was really fascinating that in my very experience, I ended up in the business community. Um, but I'm, just give me a little bit of leeway, because I'm going to kind of look at two paths within kind of changing the world. One of those paths really is, let's talk about that first path of, for those of you who do want to acquire the resources, do want to make a lot of money, do want to have those resources where you can make change that way, there are some fantastic, as you all know, there are some fantastic people out there for you to emulate. And I just want to mention a few. Stephen Jobs, of course, and Steve Wozniak, what they did with Apple and how it changed computing and changed those of us out there who didn't know what a computer was or how to interface with it. They changed the world through their business, but they also changed it other ways. Bill Gates, of course, he changed the way computers interface, mainly with business and education. And yet you look what Bill Gates and the Bill and Melinda Gates Family Foundation, what they're doing to change the world out there with their health initiatives globally. And then here in the United States, what they're doing along the lines of education. They truly are changing the world at a world level. There's a lot of us out there that the definition of world might come down to literally changing one life, whether it's in a classroom and changing one life or a classroom size, that still can be considered the world. So it's up to how you define the world. Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, of course, is a major, major player in the markets. And yet, what he's also done is create something called the givingpledge.org. Go to that website if you're interested. And it's where they have asked, he has asked wealthy families and individuals to make a pledge to give the majority of their wealth to philanthropy. And there's at least 90 plus individuals, many of them billionaires, who have made that kind of a pledge along with it. That is going to help change the world. Um, there's a guy named Eli Broad, B-R-O-A-D. Eli Broad came from the Bronx. That's where Ken is from, the Bronx. And he became a CPA. Accounting was his thing. He ended up with a partner creating a company that became KB Homes, which is a national home builder. And they, they formed at a time and created a kind of home that really kind of changed uh, the way home building was done. He later bought Sun Life uh, Insurance Company and then sold that to AIG for about $18 billion. And he turned around, and one of the things he's created with his wealth is the Broad Academy for School Superintendents. And uh, that is truly changing the world. Um, 
there's a gentleman that used to also be on our board who's currently the head of the Aurora Schools uh, down in the Denver area. And he is a superintendent. He's a former two-star Air Force general. His name's John Barry. And he did amazing things within the Air Force, was in charge of strategy, was in the Pentagon when, they, when the airplane flew into the Pentagon. He's a major, major dude. He flew uh, jets back in uh, Vietnam. Uh, he has been an amazing leader, an amazing change person within the Aurora Public Schools. He's been there about eight years. And it's because of the Broad Academy that somebody from that non-traditional type background was able to step into the world of education and make a real change at a major level within a really important community down in Metro Denver. The guy uh, that's sitting right here in the front row, Ken Ross, I've known Ken for a number of years through my role as CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters. He was our board chair. What he's done at Pinnacle Assurance, where he just left just recently, has been amazing. Um, how he has altered the culture there for the people who work. How many people work for you at Pinnacle? 600. About 600. 600 folks. When you can change the culture of a place so that 600 people have a better work experience, certainly your product and your service is meant to satisfy your clients. But think about it. When you're running a company and people are giving their lives to running that company in all different departments and focus areas, what's that experience going to be for them in providing that service and product? And you can change an organization when you're that leader so that their experience is positive and that they actually enjoy and find significance in serving your end clients. And that's certainly something that Ken did at Pinnacle as well as Pinnacle, through his leadership, creating a, uh, I think it's a, what is it, a risk management and insurance program that they created at UC Denver. So that is one path that makes a lot of sense. Um, let me talk about that second path of, of the possible choice of choosing to have your career, what you do every day, in directly serving people or animals or a disease and actually making that change in your everyday business world. It is an incredible experience. Um, if you want to consider a future in the nonprofit business sector, and I would ask you all to consider it, it is probably one of the most amazing challenges you will ever have. It will give you everything you want, no matter what field you think you might have an interest in, whether it's marketing, HR, sales, uh, finance. There are challenges within the nonprofit sector that will blow your mind every day. It is really an amazing place to be. And today, if, if that were something you'd want to be able to consider in the future, from an educational side, if you want to always have the ability to go to potentially the top and become the CEO of, of a leader, of executive director of a nonprofit. Then today, if you wanted to add to your education in a master's degree, it used to be the standard would be to get a master's in social work or something along that lines. No more. It's an MBA. Get an MBA. And if you can get an MBA where you can, within that training, be able to get, a, get an emphasis in nonprofit, that would be fantastic. But it is the business world today in nonprofits. All right, we talked about you can pretty much find every business field in the nonprofit world, and you can. If you want to um, shoot for the, the C level, whether that be CEO, COO, CFO, CMO, see all the C's, it's all in there with the nonprofit sector. Not only do you have that as an option for you in your own career, but as you move up the ladder and as you lead an organization, you're going to be interacting on a daily basis with the top business leaders in whatever community you're in. Because what do you need from them? You need the resources that they can bring. You need to bring those into your organization. So you're going to be working with a lot of the top leaders all the time. Now, in the nonprofit world, there, there really aren't shareholders within the nonprofit world, but what you have are you have our 
investors. You do have investors that are called donors, and those donors can come from the government sector, they come from the private foundation sector, they come from the corporate sector, and a lot of potential individuals, anywhere from, depending on how large your budget and your focus is, anywhere from dozens of individual donors to thousands of individual donors. And here's one of the things you learn, um, whether you're in the for-profit or non-profit business world, is that where your revenue comes from, you have to be able and willing to listen to them. So the more places that you get your revenue, be willing to really listen to their opinion and how to run the business. And in the nonprofit world, that's pretty challenging. In some ways, in the nonprofit world, it is actually more difficult than in the for-profit world. Let me just give you a few examples. Um, compete and yet collaborate. In the for-profit world, when I was with MCI Telecommunications, and my main competition was AT&T and Sprint, and I was a major accounts carrier salesperson for MCI. And so I always competed at that time against AT&T and Sprint every single day. So it's AT&T, Sprint, and MCI. At MCI, we didn't have the biggest, we weren't the biggest, we weren't necessarily the best, and yet we also weren't the cheapest. We were right in the middle. We also weren't the worst. So we were right in the middle there. We were big, and yet not the biggest, and not the cheapest. So my competition every day was AT&T and Sprint. If I could have competed and killed my competition, I would have been lauded. I still had to compete every single day in running a nonprofit, and yet I'm expected to compete and collaborate with my competitors every day. How do you do that? That's the challenge, one of the big challenges in the nonprofit sector today. Another thing, no deficits. Well, in the for-profit world, deficits aren't, aren't your goal either. And yet, if you're making certain investments in research and development, it can make sense. In the nonprofit world, you don't want any kind of a deficit because certain funding sources will leave you if you have those deficits. And yet, because the people entering in on your board that help you make the strategic decisions, they are there because they care about what you're doing. They will bring often a, a, a opinion into the decision making that says, but who we're serving is so important. If we make cuts in personnel and how many we serve, then we're going to hurt the community. And so there's a dynamic there that says, my heart is in this. And so even though we may have a deficit, so it's a, it's a, it's a struggle. In the for-profit business world, it's a little bit easier, I think, to make really clear decisions on whether you have a deficit or whether you don't. And so it's a challenge. Um, too many nonprofits. So let's merge and let's not create nonprofits. Um, it's a, it's a, it makes sense. There's a lot of nonprofits in this state. And from a lot of funding standpoints, they're like, we don't need any more nonprofits. How would that philosophy work in the for profit sector? There's a lot of folks that say nonprofit sector be more like for profit sector. I get that, totally get that. And yet, here's a challenging one. They're saying, don't be entrepreneurial and creative because we don't need any more nonprofits. Again, I put it out there. We'll talk more about that if you're interested a little bit, a little bit later. And uh, it's a dilemma that we face out there in the nonprofit world. Um, outcomes. Outcomes within nonprofits right now are key, really, really key. And the demand from funders is that more and more and more nonprofits have to prove with independent research, not only what we're doing, but why what we do matters. For example, we matched over 2,000 young people to 2,000 mentors every year in Big Brothers Big Sisters. That's what we do. We create and manage those 2,000 relationships. But so what? what? What the community is now saying is, so what? You do that, but what does that matter to our community? Will your mentored youth graduate more with relevant education from high school? Is that what your 2,000 mentors were doing? And what percentage of them actually have that community outcome we need? I don't know that the for-profit world 
today has to go to that level. It basically, are they returning a profit still to their shareholders? And whatever it takes to get there, that's the end outcome they're looking for. In the, in the, for, in the nonprofit sector, it's getting more and more complicated. All right, let me just talk about, um, you may find that as you're considering stepping into the nonprofit world as you work, a number of different kinds of organizations. There's the larger national organizations that been around for decades that are out there that have fabulous work experiences and fabulous growing missions out there like Big Brothers Big Sisters, like Girl Scouts, like Habitat for Humanity, uh, the MS Society, Junior Achievement, Children's Hospital, I mean, really big organizations where you're having to raise a lot of money, employ a lot of people, and serve a heck of a lot of people out there. And there's a lot of wonderful and challenging aspects to working in that area. You could also choose to go into the foundation funding area. Fewer jobs, very competitive, but really fascinating because you get to evaluate who is out there to make foundation investments into and be able to really make those choices. So foundations like the Daniels Fund, uh, foundations like the Rose Community Fund, the Denver Foundation, the Community Foundation that serves Greeley and, and Well County, the United Ways. So those have some wonderful potential uh, positions out there. You may prefer smaller, more locally uh, owned nonprofits that have been around for a while, like down the Denver Women's Bean Project, which is a social enterprise, uh, Mikasa, um, the Yes Institute, Intercambio Communicatus. I mean, organizations that really do some wonderful work and are more locally focused. You may also like the early stage. What I'm doing now is an early stage um, business, nonprofit. There's one I really like that is about two or three years old right now called Young Men of Purpose down in uh, primarily Aurora and Denver. And it's run by a young man who was a leader here at UNC. His name is Rico Wint. And uh, Rico um, was an Omega up here, Omega Sci-Fi, and a real leader at UNC. And he has gotten a lot of experience and work and now is running his own program, doing an amazing job with young men down in Aurora in Denver. Uh, the Beast Cycle of Denver, the Denver Yoga Co-op, uh, Diaper Bank of Rockies, the Grow House. And no, the Grow House is not a marijuana place. It is, I always thought it was, but actually they grow some other stuff. Um, now they may go into that field someday in the future, I'm not sure. But in, in my opinion, um, in my experience, the primary difference between for-profit and non-profit business sectors is the underlying reason for the businesses to exist. Um, is, the, is the business's mission profit for shareholders, or is it social benefit or a more common good. Um, let me just tell you my own story. And, and as I uh, as I left UNC, um, you know, yes, I, I went to the NFL for about nine years. And yet, in my off seasons, I was able to pursue uh, what at that time was my primary interest, which was marine biology. In Ross Hall, I fell in love with marine biology. Okay. Um, it was a 50-gallon saltwater tank that just really kind of grabbed my interest, and then we ended up taking yearly trips of about a week to 10 days to the uh, Jamaica Bay, Jamaica uh, Discovery Bay Marine Lab. I just fell in love with marine biology. I ended up cold calling San Diego SeaWorld and said, can you use a, uh, a research assistant for your research arm uh, for free for a few months? They're like, free? Cool. Um, and so I went down, and on my off seasons, I started working at San Diego SeaWorld Research Arm. Ended up getting two publications in uh, marine uh, shark behavior research. And if one of you were to um, research those papers, and if you actually found them, I would appreciate you reading it and letting somebody know you read it so that the readership will double <laughs> on, uh, on my research papers. Um, and so it was wonderful. Now, I also discovered that, you know, my family and I, well, my, my wife at the time and I decided we want to have a family. And the practicality is there's not a lot of jobs in shark behavior research. There just aren't a lot. And so I came back to CSU and got into veterinary medical school. I figured, okay, with a veterinary medical degree, I actually am trained to do something that can make some money. 
and I can still work with the marine animals. Now, after my first year, I had to step away from that by my choice because I had, a, in my mind, a very clear choice between either maintaining my family or staying in vet school. Uh, vet school is quite a deep commitment of time and energy, and uh, I'm glad I made the choice I did. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, uh, the marriage didn't last but another couple of three years, um, but I'm glad I made that choice. I then went from uh, CSU, moved down to uh, Denver, Greenwood Village area, bought a really nice home, um, and proceeded to go downtown, and I interviewed some of the top CEOs in town, probably about 60 of them. Now, it helped me to have Super Bowl rooms. It helped me to just kind of open the door, but you don't need that, you really don't. If you go for informational interviews, you start with one person, and you meet with them, and your biggest question is, how did you get to where you have? What was your path? And then toward the end, when you've got maybe 10 or 15 minutes left, give them a really brief review of your background and what you want to do, and ask their advice. And it was amazing. I met some of the most wonderful people. And before I left out of every meeting, I said, is there one or two other people that you would recommend I meet with? And that's how it just kind of took off. It took off, and I was able to meet with about 60. I then finally went back, and my question to them was, I'm a guy that wants to break into the business world, <clears throat> get the experience of the for-profit business world, and I've never had a business course in my life, and I don't want to have any glass ceiling over me. So I was thinking public relations. <clears throat> and the opinion I started getting was, in public relations, often you get to a certain level, and often you can't get to the top level. And almost every single CEO of every industry said sales. Sales, sales, sales. Without a sale, there is no business. No matter whether it's banking, telecommunications, whatever the business, sales. Do you know how to sell? That was the best single advice I ever got and the best single advice I ever took was to learn sales. And it has served me throughout for-profit and non-profit experience. Um, now, here was the challenge for me, and I'll illustrate it by telling you the story that just kind of changed my life. It took, took a while to change it, but um, I was uh, working for MCI. I was uh, a major, it was a carrier accounts manager, which meant I sold MCI's excess capacity to other regional carriers and other major, major clients uh, in different states in the Rocky Mountain region. And so I would travel a lot. So this was in a February. Um, and does anybody know where Minot, North Dakota is? Who knows where Minot, North Why do you know where Minot is? What, what about? Um, there's an Indian reservation that my mom works on. Really? Yeah. In the winter there. How would you describe the winter there? Um, that is an understatement. I, I grew up in Wisconsin. I grew up playing ice hockey outside in Wisconsin. Why not North Dakota is ridiculous. I want to tell you. It, it is a really cool place, but man, is it cold. And I remember, even though growing up in Wisconsin, I never plugged my car in. You had to plug your car in at night in Minot. Even if you're just staying in a, like I was in a Holiday Inn for the night. They told me as I came in, did you plug your rental car in? No, you're just kidding, right? No, no, did you plug it in? Because it will not start anymore if you didn't. Anyway, it, was, it was fascinating to me. But that's where I was, very common, you know, sitting in my hotel room in my, my jockey shorts and my t-shirt, studying my notes for tomorrow, because I was going to try to hold on to a multi-million dollar contract with Minot Air Force Base. And major, major long distance, huge, huge, huge client. So it was multi-million dollars of business, and again, competing with AT&T and Sprint. And I was nervous. I was stressed. You know, was I going to get the business? I wasn't able to sleep. Usually that's the way it happens. It's the same in football. I wasn't able to sleep before a football game. Well, this was like going into a football game the next day, and, and I had to win. And to tell you the truth, I don't remember if I won that day. Um, if I did, what would be the benefit? The benefit would be, really, that I made some money, manager made some money, his manager made some money, and the company made some money. And hopefully we did. I don't really recall. But here's what changed for me. 
two days later, I was at Oakland Elementary School in uh, Montbello. Um, and Oakland Elementary School um, is, is, was at that point almost entirely African American students. And I went and spoke, and I had done this for years as, a, as an athlete. I was asked to speak at a lot of different functions because I had developed a kind of a motivational talk around my background. I grew up without a father, grew up very lonely, very confused, um, very emotional. And actually, for me, as I look back, it was the violence of ice hockey and the violence of football that really helped me connect with other guys. Um, and so to be able to talk with young people, especially young men, and be able to say, here's what I went through as a young man. I now have Super Bowl rings. You know, don't quit. That, that was the basic message that I was talking. And that, that particular presentation, it stuck out to me because it was a fifth grade classroom of all um, young men, on almost all at that time, African American young men at Oakland Elementary School. And I was talking about my background. And in the middle of my presentation, a young man stood up. I had noticed him before because he had his, he was wearing a sweatshirt and he had his hoodie up. In the middle of class, he just had his hoodie up. So I just noticed him. But he stood up and he said, I don't have a father either. And he sat back down. And I, I was just, um, wow, I mean, thank you for sharing. And what was nice is we were able to get afterwards off uh, kind of the principal's office. And, and uh, he and I just sat and talked for a while. And he told me a story. Um, and his story was, was pretty simple. Um, uh, he gets himself up in the morning because his mom is already at her first job. So he gets, he gets himself up in the morning, fixes himself some cereal. This morning, he got up a little late, and so he didn't have a chance, as he said, to pick out his hair so he would rather wear his hood up all day in school. So he did. And so he got to class, and he said, like, today, uh, after I get done with school, I'll go home, I'll fix a little bit of a snack, then I'll go out to the park, then the high school kids will get out of school, they'll kick me out of the park, and I'll go back home, I'll fix some dinner, I'll um, watch some TV, and I'll go to bed, and hopefully by the time I fall asleep, my mother will come back from her second job and kiss me goodnight. And what changed me is he was just so naturally just telling his life, and he said, you know, I'm just so tired of being alone. At fifth grade, it, and I was just listening to him, and I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, how can I save this young man? How can I, and I couldn't. I was going through a divorce and trying to hang on to my kids, and I couldn't. I have never felt more powerless in my life than that one moment. And yet I knew in my heart that if I were able to take the amount of time and the amount of emotional energy and the amount of effort that I had put into that one presentation, let alone the dozens of presentations I made for MCI, and focus that kind of energy as my job, then yes, I could have an impact on a young man like that. That's where my life started shifting. It just, it started shifting. It took about two years for me to do a couple things. Um, one is I was freshly divorced and um, uh, when was this? This was probably late 80s and so I'm 34-ish, um, something like that, and um, 35. And I was now out on the dating scene. And I drove a Cadillac. To this day, I can't believe I drove a Cadillac. But um, I did. I was driving a Cadillac. It was a really nice Cadillac. It really was. Um, and I was living in a house in Greenwood Village. I had in my closet eight custom, beautifully, you know, um, beautifully pressed suits. And that's just the image I saw of myself. The image of earning a certain amount of money, having a certain title, having a certain kind of car, eating at a certain kind of restaurant. As I envisioned myself attracting the women that I wanted to attract, um, 
it meant having some money and some prestige, etc. It, it took me a while to let go of that. It did. It really did. And I'm glad it did. Um, what else? Um, I also had to, I had to swallow my ego. That's the other decision. What, if I am going to work with young people, especially young people that come from an environment that I'm not as familiar with, like an urban, more inner city environment, then the only way I'm going to make a difference, really, is to do a hell of a lot of listening and considering over what they teach me. And that meant you know, executive within a large international company, uh, Super Bowls, all that. I need to listen and learn. Those were the two key decisions that it took me at least two years to wrap my head around. But I am so glad I did. One of the, one of the, the things that as you lead companies or as you're involved on in boards with companies, especially nonprofits, you'll be asked to either create or evolve or change, adapt, the mission of that organization. I'm sure that some of you here have already worked on what is the mission of a given organization. One of the things that became clear to me is while I could do that for companies and nonprofit organizations, in this same time of change, what was my personal, just me, nobody else listening, just for me, what is my personal mission? I ask you the same question right now. If I were to ask you right now, what is your mission? Less than a full sentence. Can't go two sentences or three. One short sentence. My mission is to... I couldn't answer that question. I hope you will. If you can, you might be able to right now. If you can't, I would ask you to start working on that and continue to work on that for hopefully the rest of your life. But. What was my mission? I couldn't answer it. Um, it wasn't until I was well into my 40s, and especially when I was well within creating this amazing, wonderful, incredible the spot uh, youth center. This place was incredible. We've got about 100 young people a night at this facility in downtown Denver. We had nine music recording studios. We had breakdancing studio. We had graffiti murals over everything. We had a desktop publishing lab. We had a, um, um, an amazing magazine that took the artwork of uh, the young people unedited and um, circulated around the world for people to see. Um, we had a high school GED program that we partnered with the Community College of Denver and we graduated over 100 kids a year with their GED. We had a full-on medical clinic. It was an amazing, wonderful, weird and strange place, and it was gang leaders, it was some, and a handful of homeless and gay and lesbian adolescents who created this place with me, and it was because I was able to listen and really learn from them that we were so successful. And so as I got deeper into my 40s, I was finally able to say that my mission is to empower young people to change our world. Now, what young people and change the world how. Both those what young people and change the world how have differed a little bit. As you heard, the last seven, seven and a half years, I've been the leader of Big Brothers Big Sisters for Colorado. About three, five, three, three point six million dollars a year we had to raise every day. January 1st from the start, we had to raise that money every year. And, uh, and 50 employees, 2,000 mentors, 2,000 young children that were mentored. Um, and yet, here's what happened for me when I, in the last year, um, a year ago this past September, um, a guy named Leroy Selman died. Leroy Selman um, and I were drafted in the same year. He was drafted way higher than I was. He was the number one draft choice, first draft pick ever of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers back in uh, 77, I think it was, or 76. And when I was with uh, the Buccaneers, we became very, very close. He was the right defensive end. I was the left defensive end. There was a guy named Dave Logan, not the Dave Logan in, in Colorado, but another Dave Logan, was the middle guard. And then our, our, our coach uh, for the defensive line was a guy named 
Abe Gibra, gruff, gruff, old school uh, defensive coach who at one time was the head coach of the Chicago Bears back in Gail Sayers days. Anyway, we were a really, really tight group. And uh, Leroy was one of the most fantastic athletes I've ever known in my life. Natural, natural athlete. Grew up in a farm in Oklahoma. And just that farmer strength where he can just hold a cow in one hand and a couple, three bales of hay in the other and just kind of still be, you know, kind of looking down and see how he's going to plow with his foot. And just an amazing human being. He lived his life the way you would want your son to live his life. He wasn't a drinker. He respected women. He just, he was an amazing human being. And the reason I talk about him right now, uh, for me, what really changed for me is that uh, one day, a year ago, September, he just fell over from a stroke. Just boom. He was getting better in the hospital, and then all of a sudden he was gone. Just, just gone. And it's just, it, it's, this is really strange, I tell you guys. When you start getting into your, later in your 40s, and you get into your 50s, and now I'm approaching 60, people start disappearing. You know, they just start, people that have been a part of your life for a long time, all of a sudden they're gone. And for him to be gone, it, it, let me let me just get, when I was there for the funeral um, um, down in Tampa, uh, what I learned was Dave Logan, dead. Leroy, dead. My defensive line coach, dead. I'm the only living member of our defensive line. Now, he died at 56. I was 56 a year ago. My father, who I never met, who I don't know his medical history, died at 56. All right. My mind was like, whoa, okay, where am I at? Is there any guarantee going forward of how much longer I'm going to be on this planet? You know, what I also found out is that other of my former colleagues at Tampa, have many have either lost their cognitive ability and are going deeper into Alzheimer's type symptoms or have died or have killed themselves. And you're hearing this more and more in the NFL. It's a huge concern for um, a lot of us, obviously. Um, a lot of us have donated our brains now to the Boston University um, research into concussions and CTE, um, and which is a disease that's, that's really becoming prevalent and noticeable in brains that have been jostled in violence. Um, and, and it's... Um, uh, this past weekend, I just got back from Boston and, and going for two days of tests to be a part of their research for the future of, of how is the brain affected um, in football. And so I'm glad I'm a part of that research. But here, here was the choice for me a year ago. It's like, the question for me was, okay, I know I'm still advancing my own personal mission by being the head of Big Brothers Big Sisters. But um, am I exactly where I want to be, especially since my future may or may not be short? And the answer was, you know what, in many ways I am. But here's what did fit for me. And it finally came as I thought about it. It was that a number of people can do the job and have done the job and are doing the job of leading a major mentoring organization. But here's something that I know I uniquely want to do and something uniquely that I can do. And that's understand better the role of violence in a young man's life. That is something I have to find out more about. I have to. And I know I can do this. And so I stepped away. I, we, I, we talked, I talked to my board in, in April, March time, time frame last year. We agreed that I would step away later this year. We created a plan of transition. We executed that plan, and in the end of August, uh, I stepped away. A really cool thing that I was able to do, my son and I um, took the, the month of September and early October, and we, uh, we completed the 490-mile uh, pilgrimage in Spain called the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, which is featured in the Emilio Estevez movie, The Way. It was the most amazing experience working uh, walking every day, 15 to 25 miles every day with um, people from all over the world. It was incredible. And when I came back, uh, I created a place called the Street Fraternity, and it's still very much in its creation. Um, let me tell you about what we're creating. Uh, and this really is a, a personal journey. Um, 
uh, we've rented a space, a basement space, in a disabled American veterans building right on East Kofax um, at the Aurora and Denver border. And East Kofax is a very specific choice because it is a major artery of transportation. It is also the, the core of some of the most violent areas in Metro Denver. We're creating a place where we're going to be attracting 14 to 25 year old, primarily that age, young men who have had a major uh, significant impact from violence or them being violent. And I'm going to be partnering with adult men like myself who in our past have been very successfully violent. Now people say putting the word success and violent together is kind of a new thought to them. Well, when your job is, especially in your late teens, into your 20s, when you're still evolving your brain, when you're still evolving your concept of who you are as a young man, when you really get attention and rewards and increasing um, just uh, good self-feelings around being better and better and better at attacking another man. Because that's what I did as a defensive tackle, defensive end. I didn't have to think a whole lot. You know, that's, if you're on offensive line, I kind of feel for offensive line. Because they got to think more, you know? A defensive line is like, as soon as that ball snaps, go! You know, just attack! That's a little more complicated than that, but not too much more complicated. That was really kind of cool. I got some football guys like, oh, kind of um, And But I tell you something. There is something so magical for a guy to really, really get good at attacking another man and being successful in stopping their attack and being successful at getting to your, your mission and using violence to get there. And it's not just me that has felt that. When I talk with recent combat veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq, when I talk with Vietnam veterans, Korean veterans, World War II veterans, it's the same, their degree of lethality of risk is of course at a whole other plane than in a sport like football. But so much is similar. And when you get into that place of being able to be really, really successful, especially when you add in, let's say, the physiological reaction of when you're in a fourth quarter and for me, either in Dallas or in Tampa, so it's 98 degrees, 95% humidity. And Leroy and I, for example, would both lose 15 pounds in three hours. So you're getting to a physiological state where your body's not supposed to go. And you're stepping further and further into this ability to be violent and really exceed and be successful where your body is not supposed to be going and your mind is starting to kind of go to places, can you still focus enough to be successful? And when you are successful in that state, it is beautiful and it is addictive. And we're finding more and more that that's the same kind of place that combat veterans go, that cops go, that men. And so when we step back, so who we're partnering with are going to be more and more men who have had to step away from that feeling and the, the missing that feeling and the camaraderie of being with others who are doing that together. And so together as men, we're going to focus on these young men who are living in violent circumstances every single day in their home, in their hallway, in their neighborhood, in their school. And being totally nonviolent all the time is often not an option. And so what are their options? We're going to help them learn different levels of options. And stepping into self-defense and martial arts and different, different tactics that they can use to stay safe or keep their brother and sisters safe. Um, and then along with learning how to do that, also teach them how to be quiet, how to be centered, how to be contemplative and meditative. Because in the warrior traditions, the most successful warrior traditions, it's not just about being successful at aggression, but it's about being successful in why are you being aggressive and how does that fit in with what the warrior is doing for that warrior society. And so it is the quiet and the contemplative and the purpose that has to go along to be a truly successful warrior within a society. 
That's the place we're going to be creating, and it's going to be exciting. And yet, you know what? Here's my reality right now. I have, I have a house that I have a big mortgage, and so the bank pretty much owns it. Um, I live in my basement, which is all I need. Uh, my son and two of his roommates are living upstairs, and they're paying me rent, and so that helps me out financially. I own a Honda Civic. I don't owe any money on that anymore. I, owe, I own a Honda Ruckus scooter. It's kind of like the Shriner, those little Shriner things. When you see me riding my little um, Honda Ruckus scooter on the street, it's kind of comical because my legs are kind of sticking out. And, but, um, and I have some savings, and I don't have any debts. And I feel so blessed right now, so absolutely blessed. I am so much more happy right now than I've ever been in my life. And nothing is guaranteed. I'm still having to raise money. I don't know when I'm going to be able to pay myself in this venture. But it is so exciting because I know that we're going to change the world, at least the world that we've defined. Um, there's just a couple of things I'd like to leave you with just really quick. Um, just final, three final learnings for me for uh, my experiences. Live simply. I mean, you've probably heard this, but just live simply. Just the, the more you can control your expenses, the more you can control the level of style of living, the more choices you're going to have. And it is really nice to have choices. It really is. So live simply. There, I've always been a very driven person, always you know, just with a broad vision. And so it makes sense, this quote from Frederick Bonifiz that I've often seen, there is no hope for a satisfied man. I kind of get that, where he's going with that. But now, where I'm at, there's a different quote that I really need and want to practice a little bit more, and that's Alfred Nobel's uh, statement that contentment is the only real wealth. Contentment is the only real wealth. Here's what comes to mind for me. Like, this Super Bowl that was just uh, won. When I won my first Super Bowl in, in 1978 with the, uh, the Dallas Cowboys, I'll never forget. You get through an entire season, you win along the line in, in the championship, and then you win the Super Bowl. It is so rare. There's so many Hall of Fame players who never, ever went to a Super Bowl, let alone won a Super Bowl. And so it's an amazing accomplishment to do it. But here's the reality of our country and our country's philosophy, um, which, again, it makes sense for a lot of things, is just relentless. It's always something, wherever you're at, there's always something more. Um, but when I look back, we were in the locker room. We didn't have a chance to get showered before the press was asking us, so can you win two Super Bowls in a row? It's like, will you at least let me get a shower? You know, would you at least let me enjoy the Super Bowl victory through my shower before I'm worrying about can I do it twice? But that's just the way life works. But you as a leader, you as a future leader, are there times where we can just stop and say, wow, this is amazing. This is good. This is why I put all the effort in. My last thing. I hope in your future that you too are going to smile like I do now when I hear someone speak the quote, and it's a quote that is kind of mixed up as far as who they say said it, but the two most important days in your life are the day that you were born and the day that you find out why. I know my why now. I hope that for you.